And welcome to everyone joining us at home as well as we begin a new series on the book of Ro Hebrews, I should say, the book of Hebrews. And that's where our scripture reading will be coming from today in the first uh, chapter up into the beginning of the second chapter. So let's hear now from our scripture reading from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 4. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For, which, for to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. Like a cloak, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all the angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first through the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him, while God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. And here ends our reading, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word to us, and we ask that you would speak to our hearts this day. As I share from this passage of scripture, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever heard the phone ring and not known who the person was going to be on the other line? It's maybe not as common these days with call display, but when I was young, even, I, we, even my family had one of those standard black phones with the curled up cord and the rotary dial, right? Remember when you had to make a call, you had to put your finger in a hole in the right spot and then work it all the way around and wait for it to click all the way back. And then because of the cord, you had to sit in one spot for your entire call or go to another room and to another phone if you wanted a little more privacy. Yes, it was just a plain old phone back then. There was no call display on that. When it rang, it was a mystery. With call display though, most of that mystery is gone now. Although I know there are some people who still don't have call display, right? Anyone here? You want to put your hand up? There are a few of you, right? And you have the type of phone that you crank on the side of the wall and put the thing on your ear, right? The antique one. Yeah, I know. And that's, of course, when, I, when you have to ask who is speaking and you don't recognize my voice, that's when I pretend to be a telemarketer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, with call display, most of the mystery is gone. And I know some of you, it's still there, but, but why, why splurge on call display anyway, right? You're, you're on the right track. But if it's you, you may have to answer the phone and ask who's calling. If you don't have call display, you ask, well, who's calling from time to time? 
For the rest of us, we can hear the phone ring, take a look, and, and know whether the caller's name or number is familiar, and, 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 and consider that. Because either way, though, we come to the question, it, doesn't it matter who's calling you? Who's going to be speaking to you? Doesn't it matter when you see that number, don't you actually process and say, hmm, do I want to answer right now? In the old days with the phone ringing, you just want that phone to stop ringing. <laughs> but now we think, yeah, do I want to answer the call? Doesn't it matter who it is, whether it's a neighbor or a telemarketer or a member of your family? Doesn't it matter to you? Of course it does. It matters who is speaking. And that's a major theme in this, this first chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Since we're just beginning this book today, it's probably worthwhile to give a little bit of an intro here. Um, first of all, we know this, this, this book of Hebrews is a letter to the Hebrews. It's known for its excellent Greek and its skill and style. It's considered to be the best Greek in the New Testament. We won't see the Greek too, too much, of course, because we're looking at it in English, but that's what many have said. Also, many commentators have noted that it's written much like a sermon. It's a type of book you could just read out loud and it would come across as a message. Which, which got me thinking, that could be really convenient because one of these Sundays I could just read straight through the book and that could be my message, right? Would that work? Yeah, solid, right? It would be right. Or, or maybe I could let someone do that for pulpit supply a little later on. They wouldn't have to write something. But the content, yeah, the content of the book of Hebrews, that it goes through many of the Old Testament rituals with the temple and the priests and the sacrifices, the things we don't follow as Christians today. So if you've ever wondered how the Old Testament and New Testament fit together, this is the book for you. But today we see an emphasis on the importance of the one who has spoken. Does it matter who's speaking to you? Of course it does. And there's this emphasis here on the one who has spoken. The one who has called us, who the one who's waiting for us to pick up the phone and answer. But first we will look a little bit at the background. What's the background of this book, the author and the audience of this book? And then we'll look at, of course, the point of why it matters, who has spoken to us, the followers of Jesus, the Son of God. Okay, so that's where we're headed this morning. But first, the background. Who is the author of the book of Hebrews? Now, if you noticed at the beginning here, if you read it very carefully, those first few verses of the letter, you'll notice that this book doesn't say who wrote it, does it? Did you read that? Usually Paul's letters say Paul, an apostle. It starts with his name, as letters typically did. But Hebrews doesn't start like that. It kind of jumps right in to the message. So many have said, uh, many have wondered, in fact, who it is who wrote it. Seems to have been someone who is known to the audience of the letter, um, someone who knows, knew Timothy, as we find later on. But that doesn't really get us very far. Many have said that, well, maybe it was the Apostle Paul. He knew Timothy. But many have also said that it wasn't Paul. In the 1500s, John Calvin said this, and I have put the dates of some of the people he's referring to when they were commenting on this very question because it's been a mystery and a debate for so long. Now, Calvin says this in the 1500s. Some think the author to have been Paul, others Luke, Others Barnabas, and others Clement, as Jerome relates. Yet Eusebius, in his sixth book of his church history, mentions only Luke and Clement. I well know that in the time of Chrysostom, it was everywhere classed by the Greeks among the Pauline epistles. But the Latins thought otherwise, even those who were nearest to the times of the apostles. Notice that this is all in the third and fourth century, fifth century, a lot of these people um, commenting on this. But this is, is what uh, Calvin says, continuing on. He says, but the manner of its teaching and the style sufficiently show that Paul was not the author. And the writer himself confesses in the second chapter that he was one of the disciples of the apostles, which is wholly different from the way in which Paul spoke of himself. So in other words, this letter doesn't say, I am an apostle, but rather presents themselves as someone who heard from the apostles or was a disciple of the apostles. If you're wondering where Calvin gets this uh, in the second chapter, 
It's going to be from Hebrews 2.2. 2. But let's compare what Paul says of himself in Acts 22 to what the author of the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says. Paul says this of his experience of Christ. He says, While I was on my way and approaching Damascus, about noon a great light fell from heaven suddenly and shone about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? Then he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. So here Paul has this personal experience of Christ. That's how he comes to faith. But what does it say of the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 2.2? 2, 2, it says, The message of salvation was declared at first through the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him. So there were those who heard the Lord and then attested that message to others, including the author of Hebrews. And now, does that sound like Paul? Like, like his testimony? Like how he heard the message uh, of, of the gospel along with his audience? It doesn't quite match up very well. And, and so that uh, just simply supports the idea that it probably wasn't Paul who wrote this letter. Our best answer to the question of who wrote the letter to the Hebrews is we don't know. As the early church father Origen said, who wrote the epistle is known to God alone, or we might say heaven only knows. But generally we know that it was a sincere Christian, an author of scripture, and so someone inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that is good enough. That brings us now, though, to the second question, which is, who is the author? Well, who now is the audience? First, we do know it's a letter sent to people known by the author. He says in verse 22, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. And this is at the, in the final chapter in Hebrews 13. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Of course, it's written. Um, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been set free, and he comes in time. And if he comes in time, he will be with me when I see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy send greetings. Now, there are a few things we can note. Of course, there's a reference to Timothy, so it's someone who knew Timothy. Um, someone who said, I'll visit you. And this is probably not a stranger to those people who would be visited. So someone known to the audience... Uh, or known to the author, I should say. So what else can we say, though, of this audience? Well, it's likely that they were either in Italy, right? Or they were, uh, so, or the letter was sent from Italy to them. Now, that's the thing. You would probably only say, uh, those from Italy send greetings to you if you know who people from Italy are, uh, or if they're with the, the person writing the letter. So there's, it's quite possibly a letter from Italy, um, but who is the audience? Well, maybe the title of the book gives us the best hint. What's the book called? Hebrews. Hebrews. And it's, it's really in Greek, it's pros hebraeus, which is to the Hebrews. So it's a letter to the Hebrews, which indicates that these are uh, a Jewish Hebraic congregation of Christians who are receiving this letter. So there's maybe a hint that maybe they are somewhere in Judea, they could be a Christian uh, Jewish congregation there, and maybe it's being sent from Italy to them. But it's sent to them from someone who knows them. But either way, we don't know who wrote it, and we don't know exactly who first read this letter. But ultimately, it's still Scripture, so it's God's Word for us. And so we're going to look at what Hebrews has to say. All right, so that brings us now to, of course, the real point the point of why it matters, who's speaking. And this is what we read here in the first verses of Hebrews chapter 1. It tells us that long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many ways, in various ways, by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. Now you can see here in this first verse or two, that there are a lot of parallels going on. It tells us that God spoke. Well, the long ago is contrasted with in these last days. The speaking to our ancestors 
is contrasted with speaking to us and by the prophets is contrasted with being spoken to us by a son. So long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets, but in these last days, God spoke to us by a son. There's a lot of contrasts and differences there. This is just the, 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 the very, um, it, it displays the ability of the writer, of course, to use Greek and, and uh, to, to speak well and to write well. But you'll also notice there's a little bit of alliteration here because the ancestors, it's really uh, not our ancestors in the Greek, it's the patrasin, which are the fathers, okay? So it means ancestors, but that's the original Greek. And the prophets, the prophetes, uh, but you can see they start with the same letter. And in fact, a lot of words start with the letter pi or the letter P in that sentence. So this is somebody who has a good Greek vocabulary, can construct a really good sentence. And that's just a, a little taste of the Greek there. But notice that what matters here is that in these last days, God's spoken to us by a son, not by the prophets or the angels or someone else, but by the son. And this is going to be his point as he carries through an argument. Now that's really important that he has spoken through a son. As he says, he is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So he's drawing attention to this people, these people who would say they believe in the Son of God, they believe in Jesus, but he's trying to emphasize he, this Son has spoken in these last days. This is the final word. We want to listen to what he has to say. And He's the one who made purification for sins when he died on the cross. This is Jesus. He's the one who sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. This is the, the ascension there, isn't it? He's talking about Jesus, the one who died, rose again, and ascended. And the key thing is that he is, is greater. His name is more excellent than the, the, mess, the names of the angels. That's what his continuing argument goes as he quotes different parts of the Psalms and the scriptures. He says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. There's a scripture reference beside it from Psalm 2-7. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son, 2 Samuel 7, 14. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Or the angels, or of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his, and his servants flames of fire. Basically saying that angels are servants. But here we have Jesus, who is the Son. So if you're thinking of who's calling you on the other line, is it an angel or is it Jesus? Is it the Son? Well, the Son is more excellent. That's what he emphasizes again and again. He continues on, but of the Son compared to angels, he says, and this is a really interesting psalm because it's addressed first to God. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Now it's talking to the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So now this anointed king is addressed. And it's a really interesting shift there in the one being spoken about or spoken to. It goes from God who has a kingdom to the anointed king. As you know, anointed is where we get the titles Messiah and Christ from Hebrew and Greek respectively. But it seems to be saying that the Messiah, by being righteous, will hold the scepter of God's kingdom. There's a certain uh, a shared element there a royal connection that's drawn in the psalm between God and this Messiah King. It certainly puts the Messiah or Christ on a higher level above his companions, does it not? Now remember back in verse 2 when it said that Christ was the one by whom God also created the worlds. Well, this Christ is the Lord. And this is drawn in with the next psalm from Psalm 102. It says, And in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. 
Like a cloak, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. In other words, he's speaking to a, a group of people who recognize who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He is the eternal Lord. He is the one who was involved in the creation of all things. That's not what he's trying to convince them of, but he's going to remind them that this one, this Son of God, has spoken. And what he has said is pretty important. It doesn't matter who has spoken. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then again, the contrast with the angels. He says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And then he concludes about angels. Are not all angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So not only are angels God's servants, but they're actually there to serve people who are to inherit salvation. So in a way, although angels as beings are in a way superior to us, they exist to help us. They're here to serve us. And so it's kind of, it's not a, an insult to the angels, but it does show that this son of God, who's at the right hand of the father, is far above the angels. Now, we might want to say, okay, has he made his point? <laughs> did, he, did he go on enough about the fact that, that Jesus, the son of God, is high above the angels? Well, I think he has. But now we have to come to the point. Why does it matter who is speaking? You know, why does it matter so much? Well, if the Son of God has spoken, that's going to be more important than what any angel could have spoken. And we might wonder, why does he have to go there? Well, if you think about it, for us, it's a little different today. Uh, our culture seems to emphasize newer is better, right? It, we have a chronological snobbery that emphasizes the modern. So whatever is new is best. It's kind of like when I was talking about telephones. No one says the old phone was, well, maybe some people say the old phones were better. But uh, our phone, my phone, can do all sorts of things. Not only can I talk on it and have call display, I can play games on it. I can record this sermon on it just like I'm doing right now. <laughs> it's amazing. It can record movies and videos. It can do all sorts of things. But... That's technology. Just because some, one thing improves over time, it doesn't mean everything's improving over time. And in the past, some other people might have had a different kind of chronological snobbery saying, whatever is older is necessarily better. If you can uh, think of the Old Testament for a moment, it starts off with the books of Moses, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It goes from the law, those books called the law, and then it shifts over to the prophets. And if you were to say, well, what's primary? They'd say, well, the, the law is primary. What, those first five books are, are the starting point. They're sort of the core. And then the prophets are the ones who told everyone, yeah, listen to what Moses said. Get back on track. Follow God again. Go back to the, that law that Moses revealed. They're always calling you back. So, so you've got the core, and then you've got an outer layer reminding you to do that again. And the writings and psalms might function like that too. And then what, what you ha if that's what you're used to, the older is better, and everything is sort of like commentary or pointing you back to the law, what is Jesus going to be? Well, he'll be like the icing on the cake. He's not the core of the cake. He's the one who just, you know, puts a nice finish on things. And, and so he's not really the core of everything. He's, he's sort of there to say, okay, yeah, the law was good. Get back on track. He is of a long line of prophets. Maybe he's the last prophet and he's the best. But he's just there to say, yeah, Moses was right. And, you know, he, he interprets the law for us like no one else. And he reminds us to follow it. And that's great. And those, that would be a natural way to take a, a new revelation, a new prophet. That would be sort of a, a logical way to do it. But that's not really the case for a Christian faith, is it? We don't see Jesus as the tail end to, of something in just a, sort of a, a final chapter. He is the core of it all. And he is the fulfillment. Everything that came before him was actually pointing to him. 
so that one day when he would come, he would be the center of everything. And that's a very different perspective. But nevertheless, even though this is uh, addressed to people, Hebrews, we would say, long ago, as Christians today, we can do something very similar. We can easily take the name Christian. We can say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus. He's the Son of God. Yes, we, we accept all those titles. He's magnificent. Yes, he's the second person of the Trinity. But we see him not as the center of our faith, but as someone who came along and, and he, he looked at God's law and he, he clarified a few things for us. He told us how to live a bit better. And that's all he did. That's the core of who he was. And what he did was just give us a final chapter of following God's law. We do see that where people will say, I'm a Christian. So what's the core of your faith? Well, the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus taught. That's the core of what it means to be a Christian, they'll say. But did you know that those two commandments are from the Old Testament? They're from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Jesus telling us to follow God's laws from the Old Testament is not something new. And so if, if that's the approach someone takes, and I assure you there are people who do this, they'll say that Jesus just taught us to love and to follow God's law again. They're missing Jesus as the core. It's possible to have, oh yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, he's great and wonderful, but he didn't bring any sort of new revelation, anything new that is the center of what we believe. And that is a, a that's not the Christian position. And so while Hebrews corrects that mistake in them, he, Hebrews, this book, can correct that mistake in us as well. To not just think of Jesus as telling us to live better, to be better people. He came to do something more, didn't he? And so what was it that Jesus has said? Well, the, the key is that the Son has spoken. We see this comparison again and again. Uh, the message of the angels with the message of the Son of God. Now, if he says just the same thing, it doesn't really matter because he's repeating it. It's all good and fine. But we know he's got to be saying something new. The Son has spoken. And where are we going with this? Well, look, this is how uh, the argument in the middle is really capped by ch Hebrews chapter 1 and then Hebrews chapter 2 at the beginning. Now, this is what we read. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, who, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So he's spoken to the son. So why does that matter? Why does it matter that the son has spoken? Well, the answer is given at the beginning of chapter 2. Therefore, whenever you see a therefore, you should ask, why, what is the therefore there for? Okay, and this is the conclusion of all that arguing about Jesus is better than the angels. But this is it. He said, therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. And if you want just a core statement of where he was going with all of that, it's right there. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Because the message that the Son has given is so important, we better really, really, really stick to that. And he hasn't even told us what that message is, but we better stick to it, whatever it is, right? That's the message of the Son. Because he says this, if the message declared through angels, and that's how we might say the Old Testament was revealed. Angel, the word angel means messenger, by the way. God's speaking through these messengers, his angels. But if that message was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we ne neglect so great a salvation? And right here, we can see what the, the difference of those messages is. What is the old message? Well, it talks about transgression, disobedience. That message was the law of God. That's the core of the Old Testament of Moses. You have this law, obey God's laws. Put into modern language, be good. Now, did Jesus come and then say, yes, be good, 
Or did he come with a, with a different message? A message about what? A message of salvation. In other words, Moses did come. He said, be good, follow God's laws. And then people didn't follow God's laws. They sinned. And Jesus comes and he says, I bring you forgiveness of sins. I bring you salvation. I rescue you from the just judgment due to you for your sins. That's a different message. It's a different message to say, be good, and the other one, I forgive you. And you can be forgiven in Jesus Christ. That's the message of salvation. And he says it was declared at first through the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard him. While well, God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles. We can read about those all in the Gospels. And gifts by the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So this was a new message with a new messenger. The greatest messenger of all, who is Christ. And we need to note that. Now we won't look at it too much today. But we know that it's a different message. The law of God is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter who's speaking. Often it does. And here it sure does. And so we have to give the priority to listening to Jesus, the Son of God. And so when we look at this world where we hear all sorts of different messages, we don't know what to believe. We'll say, tell me what Christianity should be. I'll accept the label of Christ and I'll be a Christian. I'll say he's the son of God. I'll, I'll say the titles, but will he be the core of my life? That's a different question. Doesn't matter who's speaking to us. It sure does. We have to give priority to this son. Because it doesn't matter what the television says when the son has spoken. It doesn't matter what a politician says when the son has spoken. It doesn't matter what your friend says when the son has spoken. It doesn't matter what an angel says when the son of God has spoken. His message is the one to take and to keep close. His word is the one to hold in your heart through your eternal life, the one to keep and follow. Praise be to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Your earth.
Now let us go with God's blessing. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.